welcome to The Access. I'm your host, Heavy Buzo. In this episode, we'll be discussing the Trump-Putin summit, the future of U.S.-Russian relations, and Russia's actions in Europe and the Middle East. To talk about all of this, we are joined by Mark Simakovsky, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council, and Maria Snigovaya, Fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis, and a Fellow at Free Russia Foundation. Thank you so much both for joining us today. I want to start by talking, you know, we know the fluctuation right now going on in the Russian-American relationships. Uh, let's see, I mean, I want to talk about, first of all, Helsinki. This is something that everybody has been talking about. They view it as a disaster uh, for President Trump. How did you view this? And, you know, from there we'll move on to other points. So let's start. So the first, I think the performance of President Trump was uh, shocking, but I don't believe it was surprising. Uh, the president clearly pressed for this summit uh, in opposition to what many of his advisors cautioned was potentially not the right time to have this summit so close to the NATO summit, as well as not the right time so close to discussions uh, about Russia's continued activity to undermine U.S. elections. Despite those concerns, President Trump was focused on making this summit happen, particularly after his perception of success at the Singapore summit. But I think the president's behavior and remarks at the press conference uh, showcased again how this summit didn't necessarily advance American interest. He obviously denigrated the U.S. intelligence community, uh, showcased uh, essentially taking the Russian view about uh, election meddling. And so in many ways, it was a failure. Uh, because it didn't advance U.S. interests, but I think President Trump clearly wanted to use this uh, as the next episode of his uh, reality tour of Europe, where the intent of this meeting was to oppose uh, the European Union and to undermine NATO unity on Russia. President Trump has his own view of how to approach U.S.-Russian relations, and again, he has been almost committed to a degree that has surprised people within his own administration and the Congress. Uh, of his willingness to improve ties irrespective of Russian actions and irrespective of potentially threatening American interests. So again, I think this summit was something that uh, didn't necessarily improve U.S.-Russian relations. And as the president came home, actually threatened the president's interest in improving ties because the Congress and others were so uh, worried about his performance that they may actually erect more guardrails to prevent the president from improving U.S.-Russian times. So in many ways, Helsinki was counterproductive uh, to his agenda and to improving U.S.-Russian relations. How do you view it, Maria? And even if we talk about it from the Russian perspective, because we know the American perspective on this, but mm -hmm. how was it viewed in, you know, by the president uh, of Russia and the public, the people in Russia? Mm -hmm. So first of all, I wanted just to uh, agree with um, what my colleague has said, uh, and also to add that was, it was kind of remarkable to what extent you can turn if such a thing into such a disaster. Uh, we do, we of course, we expected some kind of uh, uh, outcomes in, term, in terms of Trump praising himself because that's what he always does for big achievements. And it's kind of remarkable that even in that situation he managed to exactly turn everything around and actually create big domestic problems for himself. It will be kind of ironic as well if we see as a follow-up more ra uh, Russian sanctions uh, pushed forward by Congress. We do know that the Congress is working on this bill. And uh, of course, from the Russian side, it will also be, also be a problem. Now, I would just say that President Putin, in my opinion, also wasn't quite well prepared to the uh, meeting. He, of course, was kind of coming there from the position of strength because Russia was being taken out of isolation. Finally, a president of the U.S. is meeting with Putin and actually saying what Russia always wanted him to say, that they want reestablishing relationships and things like this. At the same time, he said very bizarre things, like bringing, uh, bringing up McFool or Bill Browder or Prigozhin, his uh, crony oligarch for that matter. It's kind of not the thing that you do. Who, who mentioned that? Putin. Vladimir Putin. He said things that they were just not that were kind of not something you expect a president to bring up at the meeting of such high level. Those mm -hmm. are actually weaknesses. You're showing your weakness by bringing up those people. You're showing that it's like psychos, for example, sanctions bite. Mm -hmm. If you have to mention Bill Browder or Michael McFaul in that so context. those are the people who were sanctioned by the U.S. Uh, Bill Browder for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then he also said that he actually backed Trump. 
uh, during the U.S. election, which was also, of course, a big domestic blow to Trump, and Putin understands that. Of course, he, he should have expected a question like that come up, and he must have been prepared for a more diplomatic uh, response that would have been benefited the Kremlin in the long term. Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to the uh, Russia's uh, state TV channel's coverage, of course, it's always positive because Putin never does anything wrong. Mm -hmm. We know that for a fact. Uh, but they are a little bit worried because they know that domestically this created a huge backlash on Trump, and they do realize this is not going to help and not going to improve their relationship on the Russian side. Uh, some people say that perhaps leaks the rumors from the uh, meeting that the, uh, were leaked by the Kremlin may have to do with that, that they're trying to push that agenda forward, realizing that they actually uh, there was a big blow to the perspective of improving their relationships. So there is a lot of anxiety these days uh, with respect to the perspective improvement of the relationship between the two countries. Uh, what about the invitation? Uh, then, you know, after the summit by President Trump for Putin to come and visit the United States and then that's another big media, uh, you know, stunt. Uh, people were saying that this is probably to try to switch uh, the topic. Uh, others were really angry and thought of this as a continuation of trying to basically involve Russia in the American mm -hmm. relations and uh, interest. And, uh, you know, basically later on we heard that uh, John Bolton canceled that invitation. So what do you make of that? That's so another issue. So first to finish off the last question, I think it's very important. From the Kremlin's perspective, they believe they achieved a great victory at Helsinki because there were no concessions made to the United States and because the platform of Helsinki again showcase Russia as a country that can't be isolated and a country that the United States has to engage first and foremost. I think one of the objectives of the Russian Federation for Helsinki was not necessarily to normalize U.S.-Russian relations. I think Putin actually sees the uh, potential obstacles to normalizing U.S. ties because of the political issues that President Trump faces at home. What he's seeking to use President Trump for and seek and I think successfully sought to use Helsinki for was a way to create more chaos in the United States, to showcase President Trump was divided from people within his administration, to showcase that President Trump could be a useful wrecking ball to undermine the transatlantic alliance, and to showcase that when President Trump came back to the United States, all of the opposition to his rhetoric in Helsinki actually would showcase how divided the United States is. So in many ways, I think the Russian Federation is using these engagements with President Trump to sow further chaos. And again, to that point, I think the invitation of Putin uh, immediately after that perspective of a failed meeting, again, showcases to uh, the Russians that irrespective of this meeting taking place in the immediate future, uh, it created even more chaos in the United States because of the opposition uh, within the administration of the wisdom of inviting Putin. That meeting is still going to take place. It has not been canceled. It has been simply postponed and moved to the right. It'll likely take place in January of 2019. Uh, again, that meeting was done because of President Trump's frustration and seeing the uh, opposition to his Helsinki meeting. He doubled down and said, look, we're going to meet with Putin. We're going to do it sooner than expected because we have real issues to discuss. I think the benefit, of course, to postponing it is we finally have more preparation that the U.S. government can have to prepare the president and actually have some substantive results of this meeting that could improve U.S.-Russian relations. But in many ways, again, I think it's important to flag that Helsinki was a success for the Russian Federation. I don't quite agree with that, actually, yes, to be I want to hear what you have to say. Uh, because the Kremlin specifically needs uh, several particular uh, solutions on certain issues that are a problem. One of them is, is sanctions. If the Kremlin uh, is more or less certain at this point that they can't alleviate the existing ones, they at least want to, want to further to avoid further uh, sanctions. It, they do create a big blow to the Russian economy, they do undermine Russian businesses, and uh, uh, in general the sustainability long term of the Russian uh, budget is uh, problematic. Uh, they definitely need access back uh, to the Western markets, which are limited. Uh, instead, they receive potentially more sanctions, uh, potentially, and definitely no concessions, no uh, no any kind of solutions. As we know, the, the two presidents didn't sign any, kind, any document at the very end of their meeting, which is not very typical for this kind of events. And that was directly the impact of the 
pressure, in my opinion, that the Congress has exerted on the President, for example, by in the Mueller investigation, of course, in the Mueller Commission, mm -hmm. uh, by, for example, publishing the information about the 12, 12 uh, good old officers. So in this sense, uh, there are limited success. I wouldn't portray that uh, meeting as an absolute, uh, total and final victory uh, of the Kremlin. Uh, but when it comes, of course, to the, uh, what followed, it's also ironic because, unfortunately, what we observe uh, these days happening to the U.S. foreign policy under Trump is that it more or less disappeared, shall we say. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you see is la la lack of any continuity and lack of coherence between the actions of the White House of the present and his administration, actually. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we've seen on Russia specifically, it seems like the administration desperately trying to avoid to scale back the damage that... President Trump has done, even if, if not by his actions, but at, but at least by what he says. And we see that again. It happened with the sanctions before. It's probably why we saw such a strong response in April, on April 6th, why the sanctions were introduced in Russia in another round under the Katsalo. It's also, and to some extent, one another why we saw the 60 diplomats being expelled. Mm -hmm. It's not, what, unlike uh, what's been said uh, by Pompeo, it's not something that actually Trump originally probably meant to do, meant mm -hmm. to do. And in fact, we see that altogether this tends to escalate the relationship with Russia rather than solve it. So basically, I mean, what Maria is saying is that particularly on the ground, I mean, in, in practice, nothing that even President Trump is saying or the, you know, whatever the media stunt did to the, you know, in the, in the press conference helped Russia in basically getting away with any of the problems that they've been facing with the West, which is mainly sanctions. So, How do you respond to that? So yeah, there was no concrete uh, agreements made to reduce Russia's economic isolation. I think Russia, I think, relies less on the potential for a lifting of sanctions because they know the space that President Trump has to maneuver, particularly on Ukraine, is very limited. Russia is not willing to make significant changes that would potentially alleviate sanctions. And there are some that I think rightly understand that even if Russia made concessions, it's very difficult to see the Congress trusting Russian actions and motivations, so the space to maneuver is very limited. So that's on, one on sanctions. But again, I think the administration beyond President Trump is interested in improving ties, particularly to get Russian traction on supporting the U.S. position on North Korea and potentially using Russian influence in Syria uh, to maintain and constrict Iranian militarization of Syria. Again, I have my doubts of Russia's willingness to use whatever le limited leverage it has to limit Iranian advancements, uh, but the administration still sees that they have to engage Russia on those issues. The other issue, of course, if you know the Russian Federation was really focused on lifting sanctions, it would have stopped meddling in U.S. Uh, election preparations, and there's no indications that they have done so. So I think that the Russian Federation uh, continues because they believe that irrespective of the potential for more economic sanctions, they see more value in continuing to put pressure on the United States, uh, irrespective of having an American president there that they think they could normalize relations with. And of course, the other issue is prior to Helsinki, despite President Trump's rhetoric, you had some very concrete measures taken at the Brussels summit that were overshadowed by Trump's rhetoric in Brussels, that actually will see more NATO activity to deter Russia. You have mm -hmm. a 30s initiative where you'll have four, uh, 30 naval combatants, 30 uh, air, uh, uh, air units, and 30 uh, maneuver battalions, all that could be deployed within 30 days to any crisis point, a mm -hmm. new joint forces command in the United That's States. That's new. Mm -hmm. All new items that NATO has chosen to take to help increase deterrence. And those were agreed to by all allies at the Brussels summit, mm -hmm. irrespective of Trump's attempts to divide mm -hmm. the alliance. Basically, what you're both agreeing on here, too, is that there are a lot of steps that have been taken that mm -hmm. are not really helping Putin or Russia, regardless of the situation in Syria, because even Russia was trying to push for a plan before the president went to Helsinki, where um, the United States basically would withdraw its troops from Syria, which was not agreed on by John Bolton uh, in the White House as well. So there was a lot of attempts and, and things that Russia wanted that none of them so far have happened. Let's talk about the sanctions a little bit, because now we're talking about potential new sanctions against uh, Russia. What are those new sanctions, and who are they going you know, to be targeting this time? 
Maria. Uh, so I, I'm uh, just back from Russia where I spent um, a month and a half and I specifically investigated the issue of the sanctions and uh, the response, uh, the domestic response. Essentially, we have several uh, levels, individual financial and sectoral sanctions, and um, sectoral are those that limit uh, the import of specific um, technologies in energy and military sector. Uh, individual are those against a particular uh, uh, people in the Kremlin, but also linked to uh, Putin and financial uh, typically sanctions against specific companies. Um, so economically, as I mentioned before, the financial ones are the, the ones that are bringing the biggest flow, blow. Uh, there was uh, first Obama administration imposed essentially a ban on long-term financing and that was really influential back in 2014. Unfortunately, for some reasons uh, in mid-2016 that ban kind of stopped working. So mm -hmm. Russia has again the access to the Western markets. Uh, in this sense, it's doing better. But the April 6th uh, round of sanctions under Katsa was also very uh, influential in the sense that, first of all, everybody was shocked by the size of the response. And I just reminded that it put uh, several Russia's biggest companies, actually international scale companies, on the SDN list. That means that US citizens, are essentially uh, US companies, residents, are banned from operating with those companies and they cannot uh, do or limited, have limited capacity to, do, to operate in dollars. Essentially mm -hmm. it means that a big company like that can function. And that was a really, really strong, had a strong impact on Russian oligarchs. Because of the uncertainty and because of the scale, the scope of the, uh, of the sanctions, nobody believed that something like that was, was going to take place. Mm -hmm. And when you speak to those people, they are scared and I'm, I'm certain that the DC residents have, might have noticed that too because there's real and increased lobbying here by the Russian oligarchs trying uh, coming here and trying to alleviate those. Mm -hmm. So Congress uh, um, is now considering, uh, again, uh, working in all of those directions. I think they consider both individual sanctions and sanctions against companies. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that all of them are important and the importance of the individual ones is highlighted by the fact that Putin keeps referencing people who were behind those sanctions, such as Bill Browder, for example. Mm -hmm. He did mention him, right, during the mm -hmm. press conference in Helsinki, which is very telling. I mean, as I said, it's a weakness. You kind of, you tell where your problem is yes. uh, to the rest of the world. Essentially, I think the individual sanctions work, but they do not kind of punish uh, Russia long term. I think mm -hmm. in the long term it's important to limit the amount of resources that the Kremlin possesses because ultimately what the Kremlin does is once it has enough resources, it starts using them against the West mm -hmm. by buying off corrupting the politicians, you know, funding some, I don't know, anti-Western uh, initiatives and things like this. So I think the financial sanctions are the most influential in limited the scope and reach out that the Kremlin possesses. Mm -hmm. So it should be target, targeting the Kremlin more than anything else. Uh, yeah, the big companies associated to the Kremlin, mm -hmm. the Kremlin's banks, funds that specifically are used for that purpose. Why aren't we seeing things like that, especially now that we have a, a Congress and a public that is very anti-Putin in the United States? So I think Congress's willingness to stand up to the president in this administration uh, has been very limited. Uh, one of the few issues where the Congress has sought to constrain the president's ability to manage U.S. foreign policy is the case of Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, that has not necessarily been consistent. That occurred last summer. And since last summer, although you have had some complaints from the Congress that the administration hasn't fully implemented CATSA, uh, the Congress hasn't called for new sanctions, despite Russia continuing to take action against U.S. interests. Of course, what breathed oxygen into the room was the president's performance at Helsinki. So in many ways, uh, the Congress's response is self-inflicted. The administration could have easily uh, avoided that response with the president simply criticizing Putin yeah. Uh, publicly, <laughs> even though in closed doors he could have said, look, I'm about to criticize you, but you have to understand this is for domestic consumption. Um, so yes, there is new energy in the Congress, which we saw yesterday in Secretary Pompeo's hearing, where there's bipartisan frustration with the administration f over its Russia policy. Whether that frustration actually moves toward new legislation remains in question. You have a very packed legislation calendar focused on Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh, as well as several funding uh, initiatives for the Pentagon and other aspects of the government running out of funding. So the timeline to pack in 
Russian sanctions legislation is very short. There's two main bills right now from uh, Senator Rubio and Senator Van Hollen called the Deter Act. Uh, that is, I think, very powerful and almost unilateral in that it would require the Director of National Intelligence to issue a report uh, about whether or not there is meddling in the midterm elections. And if the DNI found uh, evidence of that meddling, it would automatically require uh, Congress to issue new sanctions, which is, again, very concerning for those that are interested in maintaining uh, led executive branch privilege over national security. There's another bill that was announced yesterday called Graham uh, Menendez coming out of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. My understanding is there are discussions between those senators that are likely going to be ongoing to see how they could come up with something together uh, that has bipartisan support. But again, the administration, at least from the perspective of wanting to limit sanctions, very wisely put the summit to the right because that summit would have made, I think, even more ammunition for the Congress to try to constrain the administration on Russia policy. But the fact that it's not happening until 2019 could actually lessen the demand in Congress to resist the president uh, prior to the midterm elections. So again, I totally agree. There's a whole range of measures, individual, financial. Uh, there's key elements that would limit Russia's ability to finance sovereign debt, uh, mm -hmm. which is a huge huge game changer for U.S. policy. The U.S. has been unwilling to target sovereign debt because of the impact of interna on international financial markets mm -hmm. and, and U.S. Uh, uh, banks. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's something that people are looking at uh, mm -hmm. and that's something... In, that, in the Congress, too. Correct. In the mm -hmm. new legislation that's there. I think inevitably what you would see is an expansion of the existing focus, mostly on individualized. I think these new bills seek to put the U.S. on a path more toward uh, sectoral and financial section, uh, sanctions that could impact uh, the, the Russian energy sector as well as the financial uh, sector mm -hmm. and the defense sector, which has been a primary focus uh, of legislation thus far. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, yes, just a small comment, right. the existing sectoral uh, sanctions are not very meaningful yes. in the short term. They're only going to impact Russia like in the next 15 years, you know, and who knows under the current dynamics what is going to be happening in the next 15 years. Yeah. Right? One thing is pretty certain that Putin will still be in power, but that's about it. All yeah. we know. So in this sense, yeah, we need to be strengthening, and I totally agree. I mean, de depending on whether there is political will or not, of course, but there's generally a need to strengthen what mm -hmm. is there. Exactly. Um, I, I, I want to talk about NATO just quickly because, like you said, even though there was a very bad public, uh, you know, uh, impression about the latest uh, NATO summit, but on the ground, as you said, Mark, that there were some agreements. Absolutely. While the United States agreed or disagreed on these agreements to make new joint initiatives to, um, you know, work together as an alliance um, to, you know, handle any potential threats. Mm -hmm. yeah. So take President Trump off the table, yeah. pretend he wasn't in Brussels. You had a very successful NATO summit in substance, not in mm -hmm. rhetoric, but in substance. <laughs> for the past year, you've had allies preparing for the summit, and there have been a whole range of measures that allies have prepared, which were agreed to in June, about a month before the summit at the Defense Ministerial. And Secretary Mattis's uh, message to his team was to prepare to support increased U.S. commitments to NATO. And so on, in many ways, what you saw come out of the Brussels summit was an indication that the United States still sees NATO as a critical ally, still sees the United States' support to NATO as important, as beneficial to U.S. security. There was a 70-page communique that the United States helped write that was ultimately agreed to. So the concern that President Trump wouldn't commit the U.S. to signing the final communique, as he did in the G7 in Canada, never took place. And what come, came out of the summit? You had this 430s initiative. Mm -hmm. You had a recommitment to a 2% threshold, which, again, allies are starting to meet. There's more and more allies every year that are making that 2% uh, threshold. Of course, there's a lot of work to be done, uh, but allies focused and understood that they need to do a better job on burden sharing. There was an increased commitment to actually create new billets within NATO. About two and a half thousand new officers will be employed in two uh, new NATO commands, a Joint Forces Command in the United States, a Logistics Command in Germany. Again, all these steps you wouldn't assume would have taken place 
with a president criticizing the alliance. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. in many ways on substance, you actually had a very positive summit, but I, I totally agree. You can't simply judge a summit on substance. You have to judge a summit on the interactions of summit leaders and on mm -hmm. the American president's uh, vision and view of the alliance. And his view and vision of the alliance I think uh, actually was counterproductive mm -hmm. and, div and sought to divide the alliance, sought to uh, put shame on Germany and other allies for not doing their fair share. But again, in many ways, he sought to take credit for burden sharing, uh, which he did at the end of the summit, but he could have easily done that at the beginning of the summit because allies did not commit to anything new. They definitely didn't commit to a 4% threshold mm -hmm. at the NATO summit. Uh, but again, that was all purposeful because I think the mm -hmm. president still is very skeptical of the NATO alliance and he feels that the only way to achieve uh, U.S. objectives is to put pressure, mm -hmm. and if NATO dissolved, I don't think the president would be very concerned about it. But again, there was awareness among allies that we have to agree and show solidarity mm -hmm. uh, on substance, because that substance is what is going to drive NATO's activities over the next year. Um, let's talk about, Buti uh, her name is Butina, is a, a Russian agent that was uh, exposed here in Washington. What happened in that case, and are we seeing a wave of basically American officials handling and, uh, you know, tackling this type of uh, breach to the American, um, you know, capital? So the Butina alleged, um, you know, accusations against this Russian citizen uh, was that she was involved in um, funneling uh, both financial resources as well as trying to make personal connections to the Trump campaign. Uh, clearly this is a new front in Mueller's investigation to focus on uh, Russian private citizens that were physically in the United States uh, potentially facilitating access and engagement with the Trump campaign. Again, previous to the Helsinki summit you had uh, an indictment of 12 uh, Russian military intelligence officers not based in the United States, based in Russia, that were helping facilitate to undermine uh, the Russian elections. Prior to that, you had an indictment of uh, campaign officials and um, uh, pressure on American citizens who also facilitated discussions and access with the Russian Federation. So what you're seeing, I think, is Mueller's pieces of an investigation that he's putting together and Butina was chosen obviously because of uh, uh, her clear connections to engaging not only with uh, the Russian, uh, sorry, the Trump campaign, but her, her relations with uh, very critical uh, Russian uh, former government officials, Mr. Torshin, uh, who clearly were also involved in uh, undermining the U.S. elections and were close to the Kremlin. So these pieces are being put together and these people the public indictments are being chosen for a reason to showcase the breadth of uh, Russian uh, influence and to prepare an investigation that will have to stand up in a court of law. These people are, are being chosen for a reason, not to undermine uh, the investigation, but to support it. And again, mm -hmm. the timing of these indictments, I think, are very clear mm -hmm. and they're important and they're, to, they're, they're not only to showcase that this investigation continues, to showcase to the American people that uh, there was a threat to our elections in 2016, and there likely is a continuing threat. And also, I think there's a there's a political statement uh, that the investigation is making to the uh, Trump uh, administration to be very careful as it engages Russia, mm -hmm. uh, because there's ongoing uh, uh, questions about uh, Russian activity that's going on right now. This mm -hmm. person had not ceased their activity. Uh, it was ongoing activity that they had been doing since 2016. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, I think that's uh, all part of an investigation. It's going to be very important as uh, Mueller wraps up his investigation. Butina will be a key part of that. And of course, the Russian Federation has been very outspoken and adamant of this person's innocence, but they've been doing it very publicly to put diplomatic pressure on the United States uh, mm -hmm. to either release this person uh, or likely trade them in the future. In the future. What do, what do you make of that? Mm -hmm. And by the way, just to follow up, uh, the, we do see that this is working. Run, mm -hmm. One of the reasons why Trump and Putin didn't sign any kind of any document afterwards was definitely the result of the indictment that was announced before. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a pressure and it, it works. And I think it's important to keep exercising this pressure on uh, Trump uh, in order to, again, to limit his uh, possibilities of improving uh, relationships with Putin.
Uh, I definitely agree with everything that's been said. Uh, the uh, Russia's uh, um, security services do penetrate the major uh, European uh, capitals and the US as well. This is not new. What is new is the extent and relative success to which this has been done. I think we are witnessing it right now. And it's true that this is also happening probably as we speak. Uh, I always ask this get asked this question uh, given that Russia's system is not particularly known for its efficiency, you know. How come they've been able so successfully kind of to achieve this kind of goals, right? Hacking attacks, penetration, mm -hmm. buying off people. Uh, in, allegedly, in, a, in a, some ways, uh, at least influencing the Western policy in their favor. Um, the, uh, one of the answers is uh, because them is using the transparency, the openness, right, and mm -hmm. kind of the degree of trust that is present in the Western institutions, and this is particularly true of the U.S. Mm -hmm. So the extent to which Putin has been able to reach out to the highest levels of the, you know, people within the, uh, these institutions is quite remarkable. And the same goes for the hacking attacks. There's just not enough, uh, there was not enough kind of um, moral kind of readiness mm -hmm. uh, to those kind of, uh, kind of attacks. But that's also good news because now that we know they're doing that and we are more prepared to respond, it's, prob it's probable that we will be more successful in stopping those attacks. In the future. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, right now, there was a plan to convince Israel that Iranian forces in Syria would withdraw uh, 100 kilometers from the Israeli borders. Uh, Netanyahu uh, was very clear that they do not accept this plan. Lavrov met with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, the Israeli uh, Joint Chief, uh, Chief of Staff, and uh, all of these attempts failed. Um, how do you read the Russian-Israeli relationships and the effect of what's going to happen in Syria? Obviously, that Russia is going to be forced to turn a blind eye on the Israeli airstrikes against Israeli uh, Iranian targets in Syria, how is that going to affect the Iranian-Russian relationship in term? Actually, in the past, Russia, at least one of Russia's purposes, was to create some kind of established relationship with Iran. And in this sense, it's kind of remarkable that the effort right now uh, on the Russian side is not very successful. So they kind of have to incorporate the Israeli demands in Syria. In my opinion, that shows that actually Russia is not doing as well as it used to, so it doesn't have enough power, internal power, to stand up to Israeli demands. In fact, uh, yeah, as you have pointed out, there were a lot of um, a lot of anxiety on the Russian side uh, with regards to Israel, and Israel keeps pushing. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, I think uh, we have some side indicators of the weakening uh, Russia's posture. So there are some of the concessions that it is forced to accept, even if those actually go against its original uh, plans. Mm -hmm. Originally, there was definitely a, um, one, of the, one of the strategies involved building some kind of axis with, uh, with Iran in, um, in the Middle East in order to stand up essentially to the allies. Mm -hmm. So Russia's Syria policy is very interesting. So in one way, Russia is a victim of its own success in Syria, that its ability to essentially uh, monopolize the use of force and stand up the Assad regime and ensure it doesn't go anywhere has also created a vacuum of power that the Iranians have filled in Syria and that now has come to a point where the Israelis will not accept and so the Israeli position has accelerated to confront Iranian militarization which the Russian Federation has facilitated because of its alliance with Iran in Syria and as a result, Israel is starting to push back and starting to take steps not only that target Iranian facilities, uh, but also target uh, Syrian and Assad facilities for facilitating that access. So in many ways, because Russia has been successful, almost too successful in Syria on the ground militarily, uh, Israel is now starting to get concerned. And I thought it was very interesting that in Helsinki that you know President Putin uh, described a very technical agreement from 1974 about Russia's interest in maintaining a buffer zone and respecting uh, Syrian and Israeli deconfliction of the line. That's essentially was a commitment of Russia to start working on maybe limiting Russian or Iranian military advances to the Israeli border. But on the other side of that victim of its own success, uh, Russia also has been successful on inserting itself as a critical broker on many Middle East issues. There's a reason that Mr. Netanyahu has traveled to Russia more than the United States over the last several years. There's a reason that he was in uh, 
Moscow before the Helsinki meeting, I believe, if not just after. There's a reason that Lavrov visited immediately after to Jerusalem. Uh, so Russia is obviously very involved and engaged with the Israelis on limiting Iranian involvement. Uh, I would assume that they would like the United States to get involved also uh, to potentially put on the table U.S. troop presence in return maybe for some Russian removals, which really wouldn't change facts on the ground. I mean, the Russian objective is to get the Americans out of Syria. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it has not necessarily been a failure. Russia will still maintain its ability to negotiate with all sides something that the United States doesn't have. And in that way, Russian diplomacy has been successful in inserting itself as an interlocutor that everyone in the Middle East is interested in engaging. Uh, whereas right now, the United States is not necessarily able to engage with the Iranians, uh, with the Palestinian Authority because of the move on Jerusalem, um, and with other key players. Uh, mm -hmm. And Russia's trying to replace the United States as a critical uh, mediator in the Middle East. Again, it's not going to be successful in doing that, uh, but some of the steps of the Trump administration has taken uh, has given the ability for Russia to play a more important role. And they acknowledged uh, Russia's presence in Syria and they said that this is official now for the U.S. but not Iran. And this is where the equation, I mean, that's also going to be weakening the image of Russia because it cannot protect its own ally in Syria while it's getting mm -hmm. destroyed See, from th this point on. That's going to be a blow. This is one of the big issues is, you know, on one hand you have a U.S. president who's very interested in engaging uh, with Russia to normalize ties. You have another key pillar of the Trump administration's foreign policy is to fundamentally undermine and weaken one of Russia's biggest mm -hmm. partners in the Middle East, which is Iran. And you know, the two presidents didn't really talk about differences over the JCPOA and the U.S. withdrawal from the JCPOA. It was mentioned very briefly, but this administration is seeking to fundamentally undermine the regime in Tehran. And I don't know if they've made the decision for regime change, but they're trying to put as much pressure as possible on the Iranian regime that could lead to a fundamental weakening of Russia's most important Middle East partner, Iran. And that, again, is contrary to Russian interests mm -hmm. and can create huge tension between the United States and Russia. Yes. And obviously Russia and Israel, or, or that's not, I mean, would Russia value its relationship to Israel more or to Iran? Absolutely not. I think the Russia's relationship with Iran is uh, much more important to Russian interests uh, yeah. than to its relationship with Israel. Than with Israel, but still cannot stand up to Israel. No, then. because Russia is so. not strong enough. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, I think, what Militarily. we observe. Militarily. Uh, Militarily, economically. I think that if you look at what has been happening in the foreign policy lately, even when it comes to Ukraine, Russia's posture has been, like, not weakening, but softening, I'd call it, over the last uh, months at least. Mm -hmm. And I think that's directly the result of increasing domestic problems. Even if you look, by the way, I mean, this is domestically not directly relevant, but yeah. nonetheless, uh, you look at the polls uh, taken in Russia. In the past, uh, the geopolitical might has always been at the top uh, following the Crimean annexation. Uh, Putin was particularly praised for reestablishing Russia's international posture and things like this. People today still credit that, him with those achievements, but the, to them, the salience of other issues has increased dramatically over the last year, and that is primarily the economic situation in the country. Mm -hmm. Domestically, they're not doing well, and I think that's also in, indirectly influencing the fact that we observe Russia becoming more maybe uh, eager to negotiate, more likely to negotiate, mm -hmm. rather than just you know push uh, forward. His agenda. Yeah, and what about the World Cup? And I want to ask about this very mm -hmm. quickly. Did that help the economy in oh, Russia? The, uh, because they said it was going to give it a boost, at least in the beginning. In the long term, a few things are going to help Russia's economy, be, uh, uh, be, except for reforms and actual elevations of the sanctions. The important thing is that Putin's rating, ironically, uh, actually declined dramatically as the World Cup began, not because of the World Cup, but because they simultaneously announced the uh, increase in the a a uh, retirement age, which is very and very unpopular news for the Russians. And mm -hmm. so you saw in June the Putin's rating declined by 10 percentage points, uh, according to most uh, Poland agencies. That is despite the World Cup that mm -hmm. helped. That is despite the summer uh, where Russians are generally happy about everything, and including authorities. And uh, this is quite remarkable. We haven't seen such a dramatic uh, backslide of the rating for at least five, seven years. It's mm -hmm. big and bad news for Putin. Mm -hmm. And now probably after it's done, 
Things are not. Things gonna are be. gonna probably be gonna be worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When Russian team won, we saw a little bit of an increase in the rating. You know. Yes. But overall, yeah, we're actually expecting a lot of uh, social discontent in full. In full. In, in when in people come back from Dutchess and they actually realize what's happening. Mm -hmm. I want to ask also quickly about the Russian. Uh, European relationship. I mean, we, we're seeing the back and forth with the Russian-American relationship, but what about the Russian-European relationship? You know, especially, you know, we know in Britain after the chemical weapons attack, people were angry, um, continued to be angry, some of them, even during the World Cup, there was investigations about Russian players uh, actually using, uh, you know, dr uh, drugs uh, by, you know, uh, that was a claim by some uh, British investigators. How do you view this relationship? So, you know, I think part of the uh, relationship will be defined by the trajectory of politics in Europe. Uh, and on one hand, you have, um, you know, stalwarts like uh, Chancellor Merkel, who's still a very skeptical view of Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, her political position is obviously not as secure as it once was. Um, you have governments uh, in Italy as well as in Hungary who have consolidated uh, a position of being much more pro-Russian uh, within the EU, which I think slows the ability to maintain transatlantic uh, and European unity on Russia. Uh, but again, Russia's actions have been, uh, I think, unifying uh, for some members of the EU, particularly with the Skripal poisoning, to showcase that Russia uh, remains a threat. Um, and in many ways, there is a, there's a tension that's ongoing also regarding uh, the problem with U.S. relationship with the EU. And so, American position on Iran uh, directly after the withdrawal. You saw Macron uh, go to Russia. Uh, and so in some ways, there's going to be some engagement in marriages of convenience between Europe and Russia to push back on American unilateralism. Uh, so it's a very conflicted view. Obviously, the World Cup was a political project in addition to an economic project. Putin tried to use it as a way to showcase that Russia can't be isolated. He loved hosting uh, the Saudi crown prince, the French president uh, at the final. Again, something that Russia likes to use these events like the Olympics um, um, in Sochi to showcase that Russia is a great power, that it can uh, successfully conduct incredible international events uh, very safely. Obviously, it, it, it loved the praise that President Trump gave it. Um, but I think European relations with Russia are going to remain uh, conflicted and tense. You're not going to see a split within the EU uh, that will fundamentally end sanctions. Uh, but there continues to be real challenges to maintaining uh, solidarity on sanctions, particularly when an American president is himself skeptical of the value of these sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I think that the relationship will remain challenged uh, going forward. What do you think, Maria? Oh, yeah, I agree. And uh, again, there are ups and downs. So there's Merkel still. Uh, so that's the good news. The bad news is that we do have a lot of uh, populists uh, and uh, anti-EU oriented leaders winning power. That is also Where? What, which other countries? That uh, have? So we have Italy, we have Austria, we have Hungary, of course. Mm -hmm. In Italy, the Prime Minister actually publicly, in June, I think he said he was going to uh, fight against sanctions on Russia. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, he wasn't that successful in that. This is typical, by the way, for many uh, leaders of his kind. But nonetheless, uh, the trend is there, right? There are deeper domestically led issues, globalization led issues that uh, bring these leaders to power, unfortunately. And in 2019, we have the European Parliament, uh, par parliamentary elections, uh, where a lot of observers also expect big Russia's interference in, sen in, in terms of backing these populist, anti-Euro-oriented leaders. So mm -hmm. things are going to be interesting, for sure. Going forward. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about Ukraine as a final topic. What do you think is going to happen moving forward? Because that's another issue where a lot of even American legislators are angry with Russia for. And uh, people are not really getting over just, you know what, they just took over and that's it. Let's just yeah. accept that, especially in the eastern part of Ukraine, not necessarily Crimea. The biggest surprise for me about Helsinki was uh, the lack of discussion on Ukraine. I think in a normal situation where you had an American president engaging with a Russian president at a very high-level summit that could actually draw real benefits to both sides, Ukraine would be a primary issue because that issue remains the primary obstacle to improving U.S.-Russian ties, particularly on sanctions. So 
I would have expected, uh, you know, Special Envoy Volker to would have had a, a negotiation with his counterpart, Mr. Surkov. They've had several negotiations over the past year to prepare the presidents potentially for a joint statement to either, you know, increase negotiations or to have some sort of dialogue, not necessarily a solution. You didn't see any of that, and that's why I think the summit was uh, very light on substance. Um, you know, again, I think that there's room to maneuver between the two sides on Ukraine. I think uh, uh, there's room for the United States to put more pressure on uh, Ukraine, as Russia called out at the summit. There's obviously room for Russia to abide by the Minsk agreements and remove its uh, forces from eastern Ukraine and to uh, give the, ter the, the line, uh, not only the line of contact, but also the uh, international border back to, to Ukraine. Uh, do I think that will happen? Unlikely. I think mm -hmm. Russia feels that its position, uh, if not fully beneficial to its interests, um, it prefers the status quo uh, over um, giving up control of its ability to undermine Ukraine. Uh, and of course, Ukrainians are coming to face their own elections, and I think Russia is mm -hmm. more counting on a, continuing to put a low simmer of mm -hmm. pressure on Ukraine. So the government in Ukraine has changed, just like the government in Tbilisi was changed after the 2000 war by Georgians, mm -hmm. not Russians. And so they're counting on the Ukrainians to grow fed up with Poroshenko mm -hmm. and to put in place a new government that will be more amenable to Russian interests. Um, so in many ways, I think the status quo is preferable to Russia. Again, I think Putin maybe would like a bold stroke, like an introduction of peacekeepers to part of uh, Ukraine, particularly the line of contact, or a referendum in eastern Ukraine, which he threw out there hoping that President Trump would bite like a fish because uh, he's not really knowledgeable mm -hmm. about the situation. But in terms of real substance and negotiations, I don't see any real progress uh, in the next few months on Ukraine, unfortunately. What do you think, Maria? And are we going to see any sanctions about specifically about Ukraine? Uh, I think that, uh, at least partly, uh, the U.S. policy towards Ukraine was good in the sense that the war they provided Ukraine with new weapons. That was, uh, that's important, and that should be continued. Of course, uh, there should be more done. I mean, the frozen conflict in uh, Ukraine is largely the result of the fact is that it's made too cheap for Russia to preserve that situation. So there is always a room for sanctions. But of course, there is no real pretext for now, right? We just have that situation that is there and nothing really changes uh, for a while. The danger is it actually will stay, remain as a, a lot of, se several actually places of this frozen conflict that Russia has created uh, in the last uh, 20 years. Um, our, our task is to make it costly for Russia to retain that territory, particularly given the, again, the economic considerations that are there. So, and, one, uh, and of course a reminder that the West and sanctions, the real serious West and sanctions were also all, only introduced after the downing of the MH17 Malaysia plane. Mm -hmm. Not really because of Crimean annexation or uh, the war in Donbass per se, but because of that horrible tragedy. So fortunately that served the awakening call for the Western community, but unfortunately if um, stronger measures have been taken before, uh, maybe we wouldn't have seen uh, the situation being as long-lasting. But for now, of course, as we have discussed, the Kremlin seems to be more or less satisfied with the outcome. And, of course, everybody's waiting for the results of the Ukrainian upcoming elections. So that will probably, that might be a new ch change in the game, in the town. Change the game. Thank you so Thank much, you. Maria. Thank you so much, Morik. Love to have you again in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was it for tonight's episode. Thank you for watching us. Good night.